You know, bullies, they've been a problem for years, thousands of years, right? I mean, playground bullies, anybody here encounter a playground bully growing up? Oh, yeah, it happens all the time. Brutal dictators, we see that in our news today. People that just are so brutal towards their people and other people. Just big bullies using their position to dominate weaker, smaller people than them. You never know when a bully is going to show up. Might even show up in a touch football game on the beach. That's what happened back in my teen years. I was 15 years old, and this gal came up to me and asked if we wanted to get a football game going on the beach. And, and she was dressed in a fluorescent orange bathing suit. And I said, why not? Uh, by the way, I'm play, but you're on my team. I had my eye on her. Coming to find out her name was Vicki Huntington. Later it become Vicki Loman. And so I was quarterbacking, and I, I, of course, she, she got all the plays. I said, go out for a pass. Go down five yards and make a right, and I'll throw the ball to you. And I, sure enough, I did. Now, I had a buddy that was with me, and he was on the other team. And I think he had his eye on one of Vicky's friends. So he was trying to impress her, and I was trying to impress Vicky with my quarterback skills. And Vicky caught the pass, and my friend creamed her. Just, just creamed, just hit her, like tackling, just knocked her back and knocked her down. The ball went flying. And I just went over there and got my buddy. Said, "What are you doing, man? <clears throat> this is that's a girl. This is touch football. What are you doing?" So I helped Vicky up, and she says, "At that point, I won her heart." Right with there when I was her knight in shining armor. It's bullying her. Israel had a bully. We read about it in the Bible. It was a group of people called the Philistines. They came from the sea. They were called the sea wayfaring people. Many people think that they originally came from the island Crete. They settled in Canaan land later to become Israel. And they were coastland people. The, the Jews were more uh, in, inland people. These were coastland people. They settled on the coast there uh, in what is today called the Gaza Strip, uh, another hotbed. Uh, Palestinians and Israelis have conflicts there even to today. Now, what made them so formidable was that they had learned from where they came from how to manufacture iron products. So they brought onto the scene a whole new thing to warfare, swords and spears. And that was a game changer against clubs and whatever else they fought with. And they began to just dominate that region. In fact, you read in the Bible that uh, when the Philistines would take over a certain area, they would not allow uh, the Israelites to have any weapons. They actually would even have to go into Philistine territory, pay a fee to get their hose, their rakes sharpened, their shovels and everything. They didn't want to have any sort of metal instrument that could be turned into weapon because they, if they could keep them without weapons, they could control them. And so they had a particular way that they would bully people, and it had to do with farming and livestock practices. They were robbers. Here's what they would do. They would identify a a herd of livestock, sheep, cattle, whatever the case may be. They would identify crops, and they would keep an eye on that. And then come harvest time, right at the point where literally the people are getting ready to Uh, shear the sheep. That's where they get the money off the wool. They were getting ready to harvest the crops. Literally, the the, the, uh, farm hands would be out in the field ready to go to work, ready to reap the fruit of all their labor. And they would show up and say, yeah, go ahead and cut that, uh, but don't put it in that bag. You're going to put it in these bags, that wool. And and those crops, don't put it in that cart. You're going to put it in this cart. And they would rob them. How cruel. People would plant a crop and they would water it and they would weed it and all this thing. And finally, to get the, the, the payoff, it would come and get stolen. All the livestock would be stolen. Very cruel practice. Uh, but they had superiority. They, they had weapons. They, they, not much you could do about it. David, King David, we, we see him uh, defending a group uh, in First Samuel 25, that scene where David and his men are on the run from Saul And they're in a region where uh, there's livestock there in the wilderness. And they provide, it says, a shield between uh, the robbers of the livestock and the people there uh, under the ownership of Nabal. Remember this word, Nabal, his wife Abigail. 
And, and as long as David and his guys were there, they provided a shield from people robbing the livestock. Well, harvest happened. They got the things. And, and this was a common practice. If you provided that kind of security in those days, it was just common courtesy for the owner to pass on some of the blessings, you know, whether it be you know, produce, whether it would be meat, whether it be money. And so David and his guys were kind of counting on that. I mean, they're out in the wilderness. They're on the run. And David sent a couple of his guys and said, hey, go talk with Nabal and tell him, hey, we provided security. Whatever's in your heart, he didn't ask for a certain amount, whatever's in your heart, could you just give us a little something? And if you're familiar with the story of Nabal, his name means fool. And he was true to his name when he says, who is David? Is it just another runaway slave? You know what? Don't I have enough runaway slaves? Get him out of here. He's not getting nothing from me. I don't care what he did for me. Well, David's men told him that. And David, I could just see his face just turn beet red. He says, strap on your swords. He says, basically, if this dude's not dead by, by night, you know, my name is not David. And he was saddled up and on his way. And again, just a very moving story. Abigail, Nabal's wife, meets him and talks him down. He ends up marrying her after Nabal dies. And just a, a beautiful story. But that's what David was doing. They were there providing security against these robbers who would come at harvest time. Now, we see an incident of the Philistines bullying again today, or bullying in, in our story, uh, in our text today. Take a look at 2 Samuel chapter 23, uh, begins in verse 8. These are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Now, David had 600 men with him during this time he's on the run from Saul, but 37 of them were called his mighty men. Three of them were called the heads of of the mighty men. These three were, were just the top notch dudes. Joshef, Basheth, Atakmanite. He was chief of the captains. He was also called Adino the Esnite because of 800 slain by him at one time. That's a bad dude. And after him was Eliezer, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite. I mean, this dude had to be mean. He's probably picked on so much and ridiculed for his name in school so much. He was probably just a tough dude, man. He was one of the three mighty men with David when they defied the Philistines who were gathered there to battle and the men of Israel had withdrawn. He arose and struck the Philistines until his hand was weary and clung to the sword. I mean, it just, it just cramped up right around the sword. And the Lord brought about a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to strip the slain. In other words, hey, they said, this is, this is too big of a fight for us, but Dodo fought everybody. The people only came back once it was, the coast was clear. Here's the guy that I want to focus on today. Now, after him was Shama, the son of Aji, a Heratite. And the Philistines were gathered into a troop where there was a plot of ground full of lentils, beans, and the people fled from the Philistines. But he took his stand in the midst of the plot, defended it and struck the Philistines. And the Lord brought about a great victory. This story has always intrigued me. What would cause a man to risk his life over a patch of beans? Not a real high dollar crop, I would imagine. And if this guy was willing to, to take on a troop, not just one, but a troop of Philistines and everybody else left. He was in this thing alone. What would cause him to do that? We don't know. I can only speculate. Maybe like David and, and his men who defended Nabal's livestock, maybe Shammah was fighting for someone else who couldn't fight for themselves. Maybe he said, you know what? I'm sick of these guys doing this, man. I'm sick of this. I'm sick of these bullies. And I'm going to defend these guys. They can't defend themselves, but I can. I, uh, I really feel that God prepares us from a very young age for, for what our life calling and what, what we're going to do for him is going to look like. I really do. I, I think that if you, if you were to look back, and maybe you want to do this sometimes, just kind of sit down with a cup of coffee or a glass of iced tea and just kind of just, just go through your life and just all the different events, all the things that happen, all the traits that you have. And you'll kind of see like, man, God was working there. I see, I see why I'm this way. I see why that happened. You, you, you'll kind of get a glimpse of what God has done and what he wants to continue to do. It's really kind of cool to do that. 
And I look back on my life and I see that he put in me this heart to defend people. Even at a young age, of course, I was the oldest of, of two brothers and a younger sister. And I've only, I only got in one you know, scuff up with someone when I was younger that I was on my own accord. Most of my issues were with people picking on my brothers. I was the biggest brother. You're picking on my brother. You know, don't do that. Uh, and even in grade school, I remember I had one uh, friend. He was Japanese. And, and he was made fun of. They, they would call him different, you know, derogatory Asian names. And I defended him. We actually, I actually became very good friends with this guy all, all through uh, high school. Uh, we became great friends uh, because I just had that thing to defend. Maybe Shama said, hey, no, nah, you're not going to do this to people. Or maybe he was counting on that field to feed him and provide for his loved ones. He says, no, nah, no, nah, this, hey, you're taken from my family. You're taking from my kids. This isn't going to happen. I'm, you're not going to go down without a fight. Or maybe as a follower of God, he felt that the name of the Lord's reputation was on the line. Saying, you know what? Who do these Philistines think they are? Kind of like when David said, who is Goliath that you defy the ranks of Israel? You uncircumcised Gentile. Who do you think you are? And he just had something right up in him saying, you know what? Who? think you can slam God like this? He just stood up. Or maybe, this might be it. Maybe he just says, you know what? I'm over this. You caught me on a bad day, Philistines. I'm done with this. You want to fight? Let's do this. I'm sick of your stuff. I'm tired of it. It ain't right. And today's the day. I've been trying to ignore it. I've been trying to, to no, it's, it's going down today. Maybe he just said, this is, I'm over it. I guess Shama hadn't heard of the saying that it isn't worth a hill of beans. <laughs> because today, that day, it was. It was worth it. He says, this ends today. This ends today. I want to leave you today with three observations that I pulled from this story about Shama and the bean field. Here's the first one. Be wise in knowing what to fight for. Not every fight that comes your way needs to be fought. You got to get this down. Not every fight. Just because a fight presents itself does not mean that God wants you to enter into that fight. There are things that you'll be called into. We see, again, King David as an example. That incident where he is... With the Philistines and hiding from Saul, he knew that Saul would not go uh, into Philistine territory. David is there, and the Philistines go out to fight a battle, and David says, hey, man, let me go fight with you. I got my guys here. We're, we're warriors. It's what we do, man. We fight. And one of the Philistine leaders said, cool, man. Yeah, we could use your help and come with us. And so they got all the way to the front of the war, and some of the other Philistine generals heard that this guy had brought David and the Jews. Now, remember, the, the, the Jews and Philistines, they were arch enemies. And these guys said, what are you doing? You brought David and his men? <clears throat> are you crazy? How do you know that if in the middle of this battle they're fighting, all of a sudden they turn on us? They, they join the enemy. Man, you're crazy. What are you doing? Tell them to go back. And so the general that talked with David said, hey, man, I'm sorry, man. I, I know I invited you out here, but they, uh, they don't want you. So you have to go back. And so they had to go all. They said it was a two or three day journey out. And then they had to go two or three days back. And so by the time they got back, meanwhile, the Amalekites had come into Ziklag, the town that they're in, burned it to the ground, kidnapped their wives and kids. So picture this. I mean, two or three days march out, you're tired. You get told you got to go back. Two or three days back, wasted trip. You're exhausted. Everything's gloomier, right, when you're tired. <clears throat> they get back, and now their wives and kids are kidnapped. And David's men said, David, what are you doing, man? We're supposed to be following you, man. What a mess you got us into. And so they're grumbling mad at David. And so David does something very smart. He gets away and he says, Lord, what do we do? Do I, do I go after him or, or do I not? I, I, I just chalk it up, they're gone. The Lord says, no, go after him. You'll get him back. In fact, you won't lose a, a wife. You won't lose a child. David says, okay, guys, come on. God just told him we're going to go get him. And so David prayed and he entered into that fight. Pray before you enter into a fight. God may want you, but don't just assume that when a fight comes your way, you're supposed to get in it. Because there's another fight that David could have got in that he didn't. Very interesting story. It had to do with that guy named Shemai. 
I think it's 1 Samuel 25, the story, where David is going along and, and they're kind of walking down and it says that the Shema is kind of walking on a plateau parallel with him. And the Shema yells out, the Bible says that he was of the household of Saul. And, and Saul was on the way out, David was on the way in, may have been a family member of Saul. And, and Shema was saying, you're a man of bloodshed. <clears throat> you're doing all these things to Saul. And was throwing rocks at him, dirt claws at him, just throwing rocks at him. You man of bloodshed, you dog. And yet you did all these things and may God curse you and, and walk along. And, and David's men saying, is this guy crazy? Does he know who we are? He goes, David, just, just tell me, man. Let me just go put this dude out of his misery. I'll have his head lopped off before that guy can blink twice. David said, no, 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 no. In fact, here, here's what David said in response to this. He says, let him alone. Let him curse. For the Lord has told him, perhaps the Lord will look on my affliction and return good to me instead of cursing this day. Let him a Lord, for the Lord has told him. Did David discern that this guy's being used by God? Maybe so, because David was a man of bloodshed. That's why God told him in 1 Chronicles, when David wanted to build God a house, a temple, God said, David, you can't. He said, you're a man of bloodshed. Can't do it. He says, you can draw the plans up, but you can't do it. And so David passed the plans on to his son Solomon. And Solomon built a temple. He said, you're a man of bloodshed. I don't understand all that. I'm not understanding all that bloodshed and why he couldn't do it. But God said, you can't do it. So David said, no, no, I'm not. hey, this guy might be of the Lord. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna fight this. This is my fight. God's not saying to get into it. Years ago, when I actually, about four years into being a pastor, uh, I had visited for the previous two years this couple that was in the church in Bakersfield. She was really sick and, and uh, he had just recently come back into her life and uh, I would go there at least once uh, a week, sometimes maybe twice a month, and I would visit them and encourage them, and, and, and they really loved me because I would give them time, and did this almost for two years. And uh, I remember one time I went over there, and uh, Scotty was his name. His last name was Scott, but everybody called him Scotty. He had a radio background. He had that golden voice. He would talk like this, and, and he said, no. He said, I like what you have to say a lot of times. But I can't understand you half the time. Doug, from my radio background, you need to slow down when you talk. You're talking too fast, Doug. And immediately, you know, you get defensive. Like, who are you telling me how I'm supposed to speak? That's that's your immediate thought, right? But then I just listened to him. He says, good content, Doug. But tell yourself, when you get up there, talk slower. And ironically, actually, uh, Vicky had been complaining for years. He said, you talk so fast. So your, your mind's going faster than your mouth can get it out. So my mind's just zzz, quick thinker. And my mouth can't keep up. She says, I can't understand you half the time. You're just blah, 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 blah. And so I recognize, kind of like David said, wait a second. Okay, this is God talking. I'm not going to fight this guy because this is God saying something that's going to help me. And if you think I talk fast now, you should have heard how I talked way back then. I still have to tell myself, slow down. My mouth, your mouth can't keep up with your brain. Make sure the battles you're fighting are for the Lord, not against the Lord. That they're for the Lord. Not, not, you don't want to fight against the Lord on something. Here's the next observation from this story. Prayer is the key to victory. That's why we encourage you to pray so much for Africa. Start today. Pray for that team. Pray protection. Pray open doors. There are spirits over there that, that uh, again, are very powerful spirits that don't want those people to be free. Pray against those Psalm 9017 in the New Living Translation says, and may the Lord show us his approval and make our efforts successful. Yes, make our efforts successful. Prayer is the beginning key for victory. I read a story in the book that the Bible study group I'm a part of is going through. It's a story of Sarah Olson and her four-year-old son, Levi. Levi was born with spina bifida. Had, obviously, as you can imagine, a lot of health problems. And uh, when he was four years of age, he was needing 
to get uh, quite a few catheters put in his. He had some urinary infect, uh, tract infections and problems, and, and he needed to have a catheter. But every time he would have a catheter placed in, it would just cause him so much pain. And in fact, he would, the pain would become so intense at times, he literally, the poor little guy, would pass out because of the pain. It, it was just extreme. He would cry, no, mommy, no, mommy, when they put it in and just, just cry, and just boom. Just so painful, he just passed out. Well, she took him in, and the doctor says, I got bad news for you, Sarah. We've we got to put another catheter in. His, 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 he's not draining you know, his urine properly. We, we've got to do that. And she says, doctor said, I'm not going to do it. He said, I, I cannot go through another incident of Levi with it. I can't do it. He says, well, you have no other option. She says, I'll come up with something. I'll find an option. He says, what are you going to do, Sarah? Are you going to invent something? She says, yeah. I'm going to invent something. She was kind of halfway kidding, but just that determined mama bear, right? So she walked out and said, God, I didn't even finish college. I have no medical background, but God, I need something. Lord, I cannot stand watching Levi in that pain. And she said, as soon as she began to pray, she said, all of a sudden this image popped in her mind. Oh my gosh. She rushed home. She began to sketch it out, just kind of draw it out, real rough drawing it out. She took it to a friend who uh, had this program on the computer. They eventually found a CAD program where you can actually draw something, and they drew up a design. They found a manufacturer that, that would make a prototype, and they made it. And so a couple of weeks later, she called the doctor and said, hey, can I come in? I want to show you something. And she went in there, and she says, remember you told me that, hey, uh, if you want something different than the Foley catheter, that was a catheter that was being used, the Foley catheter would go into your bladder and they would have on the end of it, it would have a little balloon that would inflate with liquid. And that would keep it, it would go in there, then it would inflate and it would keep it from popping out of your bladder. If not, it would just, it just keep falling out. But that bladder did not like that foreign object in it. It, it would cause spasms of the bladder. It would cause infections there. And, and so... Uh, she said, if, if you're going to design something different than the, the Foley uh, catheter, you're, you're going you're gonna to need to come up with something. And she says, I've shown you. Uh, I want to show you something. Here's what I come up with. And she laid it out there. And she began to explain sin. What this catheter does that's different is it doesn't have a balloon at the end to secure it in place. Actually, the, the stabilizing will be on the outside of the bladder. And she called it, actually, she said, Levi's called it the lizard tongue. It was a tape that they found from a manufacturer that would stick onto the bladder on the outside. So, so the balloon wouldn't go on the inside. The tape would keep it stable on the outside and it would allow the, 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 the urine to, to go without having that foreign object inside the bladder. And the doctor looked at it and said, this will work. This will work. She said, good. <clears throat> Can we put this in? She goes, he said, not yet. You need a patent. I can't do anything until you get a patent. And you better hurry because we got this procedure in 32 days. Long story short, she went out and got the patent. They put in the Lex catheter, L-E-C-S. That was the, what it stood for is Levi's, what's it stand for me? Right? Levi's external catheter stabilizer. The Lex <laughs> catheter. <clears throat> put it in him. Typically when they put the Foley catheter in someone or in Levi, he'd be in the hospital two or three weeks, infection, just terrible pain. Put the Lex catheter into him. He stayed overnight just for observation. No infection. Went home the next day. Doctor said, hey, you're not done yet. He said, you're kind of like a Moses that God called you to bring some people out. He's called you to go for other people. He said, this, this could change other people's lives. He said, you, you need to get this thing manufactured on a, on a larger scale. She said she went to one uh, investor and got in and started to tell her story. And he laughed at her and said, hold on. He said, you remind me of a ferret on meth. True words. But she said, she said what? Said, yeah, you're just all excited. And you're all giddy. He says, this will never work. He said, the medical industry, man, they're going to protect this Foley catheter, man. Because if, if you create a, a competitor, man, they're out of business. They're going to fight you. They're going to do everything away. And you, you're in a pipe dream. She got up and said, you know what? Thank you for saying that. He says, you haven't discouraged me. He says, you've lit a fire underneath me. 
He said, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you. This is going to work. And you know what? Thank you for lighting a fire underneath me. Goodbye. And she walked out. And she kept on it and eventually got investors and got it produced. And today, the Lex catheter is, is, is on the market. Just why? Because one mom had the audacity to pray and to ask God for something. I'm not saying that God's going to give you a, a new invention. I'm not saying that everything that we pray for will come to pass. But I knew, do know this, that bullies and mountains are only moved with prayer. That I know. That I know. Pray. It's the key to victory. Lastly, faithfulness is the key to greatness. Faithfulness. Remember my sermon? Faithful, 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 faithful. Faithful, 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 fruitful. You're 10 times more faithful than you are fruitful. Everybody wants to be fruitful without being faithful. God says if you're faithful in a little, you'll be faithful in what? Much. You'll be faithful in a little before you can be faithful in much. Shama became one of the three mighty men because he was faithful. He didn't set out to be a mighty man by defending that bean field. He just knew that, hey, I'm to fight this fight. It may not be significant to other people, but this little patch of beans is important to me, and I'm going to fight for it. And as a result of that, greatness came to him. Now, let me end by probably retelling for some of you, if you've you're been here a while, of a hero in my life. There are many heroes. They come in many forms. Bullies come in many forms. Heroes come in many forms. <clears throat> One of my neighborhood heroes was a man by the name of, a boy by the name of Larry Mitchell, four years older than me. Poor Larry was. Poor. Lived in a rental house. Had seven or eight brothers or sisters. Stepdad was raising him, pretty mean to him. His mom, uh, in fact, you know how kids can be mean and cruel. I was one of them. We used to make fun of his mom before I really knew Larry well. We would see her driving down the street, and she'd be kind of driving, kind of shaking. Oh, look, there's a drunk lady. Look at her. No, she wasn't drunk. She was in the early stages of Huntington's disease, very much like MS. Uh, it eventually took her life. And so, so Larry was in that home uh, uh, with a mom very sick and a stepdad that, that was pretty mean to them. But uh, Larry was a hard, hard worker. And he was like a big brother to me. I was oldest in my family. He's like a big brother to me. And different generation then. You didn't have the proliferation of guns when conflict came up among kids. You just kind of take care of it the way that, you know, you just scrap and wrestle and take care of stuff. And so uh, I had a situation where I was, I can't remember the details, but I remember this bigger kid uh, chased me, literally chased me into my grandparents' home, which lived a couple blocks away. I'm sure I mouthed off to him or something. And, and he chased me in there and he's kind of waiting for me outside. And I, I knew I couldn't beat him. He's bigger than I was. So who did I call? My hero, Larry. Larry. I'm sure I give him some sob story. This guy's picking on me for no reason at all. <laughs> all Larry, I remember him saying this. I'll be right there. Boom. And all of a sudden, Larry showed up. And well, meanwhile, this guy took off. And I, which way did he go? Larry said, which way did he go? He went this way. He went over there. So we saw a guy, you know, just starting to walk away across his field. Larry said, here's what we're going to do. So I'm going to go down here uh, in between the two houses behind this bush, okay? You, you, you call that guy and tell him, you'll fight him. I'll fight you now. And, and you, you lure him down here. And then I'm going to come out behind the bush. And, 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 and I'll surprise him that way. And I said, sound like a great plan, Larry. But just one little caveat here then we'll make sure that we we're both on the same page on Larry don't be late from coming out from behind that bush <laughs> if you're going to err err on the side of coming out from behind that bush early do not come out late because he's going to pound me and sure enough I got up here come on man I'll fight you come on oh the guy oh man so he comes over and all of a sudden I get in that thing and now here comes Larry and Larry did what Larry does and, uh, yeah, so he took care of it. He was, he was my hero. You have someone in your neighborhood. You have someone in your family that you can call upon when you need somebody to come. When somebody's bigger than you and a bully is pushing you around, and that person is Jesus Christ. His name is Jesus Christ. He's not only your Lord. He's not only your Savior. 
but he's your friend. He's the captain of the Lord's army. He's a friend that says he'll sit closer than a brother. He'll be there for you. Psalm 50, 15 says, call upon me in the day of trouble and I shall rescue you and you will honor me. Now, here's, here's the phrase, here's the thought that led to this whole sermon. This thing started percolating about three weeks ago. Here's the thought. It's time for some of you to take a stand. There are bullies. There are mountains in your life that have you intimidated, that have stolen faith from you, that have stolen hope from you, that you have just said, I guess this is how my life's going to be. I'm just going to have somebody come and rip off my field and rip off my livestock. And, and I'm just going to have to live with this thing. I'm not, I'm not going to try to change it. I'm just going to have to learn to live with it. And today I want to tell you that, that God is saying, no, you don't have to live with it. There are things that are rightfully yours, just like that bean field. That was Shama's bean field, or it was the people that he was protecting. And he didn't have to give that thing up. And when he stepped out in faith, it says that God gave them the victory. For some of you, you've got to take a step of faith. You've got to face that fear. You've got to stand up against that thing. What am I talking about? I'm talking about things like faith. Some of you, you're losing your faith. You're praying for children that are wayward. You don't see any movement. You're starting to lose your faith. Don't you give up. Here's, here's what you need to know. I've walked with God longer than a lot of you. Most of you probably here. Here's what you need to know about God. Prayer is, is when, when you pray and when God's going to do something, it's long in the making oftentimes. But when it happens, it happens really quick. That's a signature of God. It's long in the buildup. It's long in the preparation. But when God moves, all of a sudden it's like, wow, how did that happen? Just, man, all, yesterday was like this. Today it's like this. That's God. Don't you give up praying for those kids. Your mental health. <clears throat> Do you realize how broken this world is? How broken we are as people? Our minds are broken. These bodies are are affected by sin. Our minds get spun out. I notice the older I get, I'm I'm starting to lose my mind. I thought I thought you know I forgot we actually we had the pray over the Africa team. I'm asking for my pulpit. Oh yeah, we can pray over the Africa team. You start getting absent-minded as you get older. I go around. Vicky goes to bed about 30 minutes before I go to bed every night. So she's in there. And, and so uh, my job is when I go to bed, I turn off all the lights and I lock the doors. And I, I find myself increasingly doing this where I'll go lock the back door. I'll lock it. And maybe I'm thinking about something. I'll get the front door. Did I lock that back door? I think I did. Oh, let me go back and check. <laughs> I'll get in bed. and Did I lock the garage door? Oh, my gosh. Get up out of bed. Any of you ever do that? Like, oh, my gosh. I find myself just lose. Oh, man, your mind can just get spun out on you. For some of you, your fight is against your mind, against fear, against depression, against anxiety. You've got to fight that. You've got to fight this. And I will not settle with this. I will not settle. Your sobriety, for some of you that struggle with addiction. Jesus said, I've come that you might be set free. He who I set free is free indeed. <clears throat> it's there. I'm not saying it's easy. I know it's I come from a family of addicts. I'm an addict. I understand that. But that's God's will for you. It's there for the taken. It's there for the taken. You ask God how he's going to guide you to it, but it's there. It's yours. And I can go on. Let this story of Shama and the bean field encourage you. It's time for some of you to take a stand. Fight for that thing that is yours. All right. Well, I want to get you encouraged, inspired, and fired up, okay? A lot of fire underneath you today. All right, let's pray this. Father, Lord, you've given us things, Lord. You've given us things. You've, you've given us new life. You've given us new, uh, the Holy Spirit. You've, you've given us a clean slate from our sins. You've given us families. You've given us jobs. You've given us uh, whole minds, Lord. We can take over that captive. You've given us authority. Oh, Lord, the list goes on. Those are things you want us to have, <clears throat> but we've got to fight for them, God. We've got to invite you in. You, you, Oftentimes, you'll say, you take a step, and then I'll come and provide the victory. We have to take that first step, just like Sean had to say, today I fight. 
today I fight. Once we fight, then your power comes. So God, I pray, Lord, that that would just set in the hearts of those that need to hear that today. If you don't know Jesus Christ, you need to know him because he's coming back. Things are being set up. I'm telling you, things prophetically are being set up. It's in place. It's in place. Scripture is starting to come to pass. You don't want to miss it. There's a whole new world up there. There's a whole new body waiting for you, Christians. There's a whole new world, a new heaven, the new earth that are waiting for us. It's fantastic, but you must be born again. You must acknowledge your sin. You must receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You must turn from your sin. If you do that, you'll be given a gift. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit. He'll change you, but you must be willing to turn the controls of your life over to God. So if you're here today and you want to do that, maybe you've done that and you've fallen away, you've gotten discouraged, but you say, today I'm back on track. All I'm going to ask you to do is raise your hand. I'm going to say a prayer with you. I'm going to agree with you that today you're giving your life to God. Today you're going to begin to walk and follow him. Raise your hand up. Who needs to be born again today? Who needs to recommit their self to Jesus Christ? I'm not talking religion. I'm talking radical living for God, being willing to do whatever God wants you to do. Raise your hand up. Who am I praying with today? Who am I praying with today? Raise your hand up. I'm talking radical lifestyle. I'm talking about listening to God. I'm talking about taking a hold of that which God has given you. Okay, you that have your hands raised, along with everybody, I want you to pray this prayer together. Say, Father God, please forgive me my sin. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross. I make him my Lord and my Savior. Come inside of me, Holy Spirit. Cause me to be born again. And I turn the controls of my life over to you. Amen. You keep coming to church. You get a Bible. You talk with somebody. Your life will never be the same. Let's go ahead and stand up.